Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Perfect, your host. And with me today, of course, is Brandon Noway. And we've been talking to one another so much, we said we need to speak to somebody else who's a real expert. So we invited Sarah Sanchez here with us today. Hey, Sarah, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. It's great having you here. Sarah, if you guys don't know, and you should, you can find her on Twitter at BCB underscore Sarah, S-A-R-A. All righty. And you'll find about Sarah, too, is she's been covering the Cubs for some time. And she's a writer and also a podcaster. You can find her on Bleed Cubby Blue and also Cup of Cubby Blue. Can can you tell us a little bit about those uh, what you're doing in those portals? Yeah, so Bleed Cubby Blue is the SB Nation community for Cubs fans. You can find pretty much everything you need there from deep dives on the minor league system, what the Cubs might be doing um, with any rule minor league rule five stuff that they can do at the moment stuff about the lockout. Um, I actually am about to start my annual 12 days of Cubs myths, which is just a retrospective on the, on the Cubs years and things that happen that happen to follow those numbers one through 12. And then uh, cup of cubby blue is our Cubs podcast that comes out weekly, just sort of looking into different cup stuff. And, you know, you might be mistaken after that trade deadline monstrosity that the Cubs had, but they are actually doing things and trying to like make moves and stuff. So the Cubs are the Cubs may be fun again. Who knows? But I, I imagine we'll get into that today. Oh, you betcha. But we'll start out at, at kind of a top tier level. Brandon, you were talking about some things earlier before the show started uh, overall about Major League Baseball. What, what was the, the conversation going with that? Well, it's it's no secret that they're they're in a lockout right now. And I just want to get your opinion, Sarah, on, you know, Mark and I kind of talked about it last year when they were going through the negotiations for the 60 game season. Was this something that like then you could kind of see, too, that this was going to be a real possibility or was it something that, you know, maybe they can get a deal done at the last second? Well, I think both of those things are true. I think that there's a real possibility that they can get a deal done at the last second. Let's keep in mind that Major League Baseball is a 11 billion with a B dollar industry. So every day that they're not playing games, every day that they don't start spring training on time, anything like that, that, that's bad for everyone. That's bad for the owners. It's bad for the players. It's time that they are not making a lot of money (laughs) that they make hand over fist. But I think that it was pretty obvious based on the contentiousness of the negotiations for the 60 game season. And, And honestly, even before that, I, I think if you look back to the very slow free agent classes of 2019, 2018, 2017, it it was pretty clear that some concessions had been made in the most recent um, collective bargaining agreement, the one that was concluded in December of 2016, that had really tilted the scales way towards the owners and, and away from the players. And there were a couple of warning signs even before the pandemic season that sort of let you know there were going, this was going to be a different negotiation. So I believe it was about 2018, the MLBPA hired Bruce Meyer, who is a labor attorney who's known for his work in negotiations like this to take on the nuts and bolts of the CBA and ultimately the pandemic shortened season negotiations. And you saw just a very different posture than what you had seen from Tony Clark. Before And that's no shade to Tony Clark. Tony Clark is a great representative and head of the MLBPA, but he's not a labor lawyer and he's going to approach these negotiations differently. And I, I think, I know we'll get into all of this, but I think if you listen to what the players were planning for, you know, there was a great gem on rates and barrels a couple of weeks ago. Uh, That's a great podcast with Derek Van Riper, you know, Saris, Britt Giroli. And Britt Giroli mentioned that in conversations with Max Scherzer, who is one of the main union reps for the MLBPA, he said that they've been socking away their licensing fees. The players have, have kind of created a little war chest so that it's they have money in reserve for an extended fight if they need it so that they can credibly tell MLB, no, that proposal is not going to work for us. So we're going to sit it out for a little while longer. Um, I think that there's there's been signs like that throughout the last few years. You know, you, they bring in a labor attorney. They're they're sacking away money for this, and and it's not because. Of, and I want to be clear here. I'm very team players, uh, as both of you know. If you follow me on Twitter, I'm I'm very much like workers should be paid what they are owed. <laughs> but I think that it's important to remember that the contentious negotiations. MLB has always been able to break that by nobody wants to watch billionaires and millionaires fight about money. 
they want to watch baseball, right? And once upon a time, it really did. The only baseball players you knew about were the ones making millions of dollars. But a lot of them don't. In fact, the majority of guys playing in the major leagues these days <laughs> don't. They're making, you know, the league minimum and and or a per diem as they bounce back and forth towards AAA. And, and, and you know better than anyone that that's how teams operate these days. They try oh, to yeah. keep as many guys on that bare minimum payroll as possible in order to keep that bottom line down. And as more teams have started doing this, right, it's it's not a new thing. It's a thing that's happened before. But as more teams have joined that club, players have just lost out on more and more and more and more of the revenue share of the profits in baseball. And no worker, no union is going to be satisfied with that. So it's going to be a bit of a fight. We'll see how it goes. Well, it's, it's interesting you bring it up because I'm thinking and saying, oh, my gosh, when you're talking about the profit sharing, we could do a whole show another time just on, on that because looking at, you know, Pittsburgh Pirates, how much money do you give them each year and expect something back? Where are they putting it? Are they put it in their pocket? Are they spending it? Is it going on international signings? All those sort of things. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm neither a lawyer nor an accountant, but it seems like a, a deeper dive should be done there more than I can. I'm neither a lawyer nor an accountant either. Just a girl who reads a lot about baseball and digs into every set of numbers that I can get put in front of me. And and you're absolutely right. The revenue sharing is a point of contention. I, I think the revenue sharing part of this is fascinating for a couple of reasons. One is that there is some sort of baseline amount of money that every MLB team is getting. Now, it, it, MLB teams are a little bit, you, you don't really get to peek behind the books most of the time. Yeah. A lot of this is conjecture. Um, You have to find teams where there's things like public financing on their stadiums to actually look at the numbers and see what's going on. So I'm looking at you, Atlanta, you <laughs> public financing on, on new stadiums gives us a peek behind the curtain every now and again. Um, but the, but the bottom line is that a certain amount of money from the bigger clubs, from the TV deals, from the licensing for, you know, watching Sunday night baseball and yeah. the field of dreams, all of those things gets socked away and distributed to what are called the mid-market teams. So you're not talking about the Chicago's of the world. You're not talking about the New York's of the world. They're the Boston's of the world. But, you know, this, the teams that the Tampa Bay Rays of the world, <laughs> the, the Miami Marlins of the world, they, they get a little bit of extra money. And, and the question for the players, and from their perspective, my understanding is they want that money and maybe a little bit more earmarked for salaries what would be called a salary floor something mlb has never had they're like if you're going to take x number of millions of dollars and, and to be clear it's multiple millions of tens of millions of dollars we're not talking five million dollars here we're talking 50 60 we're talking like lots of millions of dollars they want that guaranteed to go to payroll and i think that that's an eminently reasonable request what's interesting to me there from a you know, I'm an old uh, political science girl. I kind of like baseball is my side gig that I just happen to love a lot. And so I talk and write about it a lot. Um, so I've read a lot of economics and political econ economic, economics history and those types of things over the years for various classes. And the thing that's interesting to me here is that the revenue sharing argument really drives a wedge between the owners, right? Yeah. Because the owners want parity there as well. They don't want some teams never like, just never paying players and they're always getting great draft picks. They want a chance at those draft picks too. So there's, that's a wedge issue that the players have generated that actually drives a wedge, in my opinion, between say the Boston's of the world and the Rays of the world. Is that something that the CBA itself would address? I mean, or is that something that the owners have to address internally? Well, it can address it in terms of rules like a salary floor, or it can address it in terms of rules like a minimum wage, right? And these are all slightly different things. So if you think of a salary floor, you're thinking about, and, and I believe in a salary floor. I personally, I, my recollection is that MLB proposed one that was right around $60 million. That is laughably low. <laughs> so admittedly, like that's an opening salvo that they knew wasn't going to be taken. The fact that they said the word salary floor, I guess, should be congratulated. Um, I sort of feel like, if you have a major league baseball team in your city, you should be able to spend $100 million on payroll for your players. And I don't think that's too large of a number. I mean, when you consider that the teams who are brushing up above and against the luxury tax are hitting in the 215, 220, 230, 240 range, asking teams to hit right around $100 million is not a huge ask. And the teams that would be most ready and willing to say, no, no, we just can't do that. It's too difficult 
um, are already making some moves that make you think maybe that's not true. I mean, the Rays just offered Wander Franco the largest deal in the history of the franchise. And you know what? That's a great deal. They locked up his arbitration years and gave him more money than he would have made. They gave him a little bit more money on the back end. It's not as much as he would have made in free agency, but there's no guarantee you'll hit free agency if you get hurt or something like that. So for Wander Franco, that is my family is fine for multiple generations money. <laughs> and for the Rays, they now have a player who's going to make, you know, $20 million a year for the first time. I don't know. Has that ever happened? I don't think that's ever happened. Brandon, you can address this more than me about Beth Franco is looking at what was the expectation we were saying, Oh, look at this guy. He's number one prospect for two years in a row. Oh, look at this guy. He's a, he's candidate for the rookie of the year. Well, Brandon, what were you thinking when you, we saw this with Franco? Yeah. I mean, everybody was saying like, he's going to be this generational talent, you know, a prolific all-star, one of the top players in the league. And he's going to only be making, I believe, I don't remember off the top of my head, it was like 170 million over the next 10, 11 years. So that's going to be a bargain in a few years, looking at how these deals have gone. Well, and you think of these players, uh, if, uh, to have a short contract when you don't know what entry may or may not come, you know, and God forbid, but it does happen out there. It's it's an insurance policy, I think, to have something that high. And yes, maybe you do give up something today. But well, let me ask you another thing, Sarah. Do you do you anticipate seeing uh, shorter contracts with players in the future? I mean, we're seeing a little bit of both right now. Yeah, that's a great question. I was just looking up the specifics because I I want to correct myself on the twenty million thing. I don't think it quite hits twenty million. I think it. I think with incentives, it's like twelve years to twenty three or something. So it's just shy of 20 million but still that's a that's a pricey deal for the Rays and and it's one that you would like to see players make with young talent all over the league repeat your question mark i just lost it trying to correct myself on that's that. all right i lost my <laughs> no i was talking about do you think we'll see uh longer contracts shorter contracts or is that even a thing is it just case by case basis well i think it's a little case by case basis but i do think there's a move towards some of these high aav um shorter year deals and and you know that's what the cubs just did with marcus stroman they offered him a contract that gives puts him above the annual value that he that say gossman or um robbie ray would have made which are the other players who are kind of in that same tier of pitcher that he was in for this free agent class. Um, but it's only a two year deal with a third year option. And so they get out rather quick for the player. That's nice because for a player like Stroman, that means he gets another bite at the free agent apple at some point in time, right? Like he's not locking himself in indefinitely to the current CBA. I was actually a little, and we can talk about this a little bit. I was a little stunned with how busy it was right up until the lockout. I didn't, I did not believe there was going to be a flurry of signing activity, but it turns out baseball players, their agents and MLB front offices are human and they like knowing what's going to happen in the future, <laughs> whether or not they like have the most specific details of the next contract or not, right? Like people want to know where they're going to live. They want to know where they're going to work. They want to know, yeah, I don't have to worry about that anymore. When this lockout thing ends, I have a deal. I'm playing in Chicago. Well, yeah, no, I get that. Um of course, if you're Tampa Bay Ray, you never know where you're going to be working. It could be here, it could be in Canada. But coming back to to what you say, yeah, there, there's a there's a sense of of having that in place, you know, having that done. So the hot stove turned into like a, a giant furnace for about a week there, and then now they've turned the daggone thing off. A spout has been shut. There's no gas coming in, and that means nothing coming out of the mouth of Rob Manford. <laughs> so no gas, no Brad Manford, and we'll we'll see what comes. Hey, I, I've heard something the other day. I like like both of y'all to kind of comment on this. There's a radio show. It's called Bobby Bones. I don't know if you've ever heard of this syndicated show or not. And the guys got a couple other people on the show with you, and they're talking about their children. One of the guys, his name is Eddie. He's got a, a child whose grades are not really doing what he needs to do. He's he's done everything. He's taken away his electronics. He's he's had him. You can't go out and do this. You can't do that. Finally, his solution was this: his solution to get his child to better grades. And he has to achieve it by the finals. Well, I guess here coming up at Christmas is the child would have two meals a day. And both of those would consist of a bologna sandwich on white bread. That's it. No condiments, nothing else. To, I'm sorry. And amazingly enough, kid, not surprising. The kid, y'all, he's great, dad. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Two or three days later. Hey, dad, can I have some mustard? No, no. Can I have some of this? No. 
So the thing that was is now, you know, nine days into it, he's just really crunching, getting into the schoolwork. So what do we do with Rob Manford? Do we, do we feed him bologna sandwiches? Do we do something to give him that extra oomph? Because if we limit, what is it going to take to him to say, okay, unlock. And even if he does, once we unlock this whole conversation about the CBA, what is going to be the impetus to say, let's get something done. Well, I'm so glad that you framed that as, and the lockout specifically as a choice that Rob Manfred and the owners made. I didn't have to happen right now. It could have happened later. Um, now it's, it's a tactical decision. It's a tactical decision to try to put pressure on parties to come up with different negotiations. But I'm with you. I feel like we're in a situation where we're stuck in this bologna sandwich loop because what's happened, nobody's putting new proposals out on the table right now. They're not talking about the core economic issues that they're separated on. Um, according to some reporting from Evan Drellick over at The Athletic last week. And, and and if you're not talking about those things, you're not moving them forward. You didn't get anything out of all of December and January. You're just, they're talking around those issues at the moment, right? So there was a meeting, I believe at that meeting, they talked about some issues that are at the fringe of the CBA um, tweaks that they might make to the child abuse and domestic violence policy, looking at issues around things like rules changes, the, the DH, um, talking about expanded playoffs, those types of things. And those are all important things. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I think those are those are key things. And if you ever look at the CBA, it's a beast. It's, you know, I think it's close to 200 pages of annotated legalese about all of the different variety of rules and changes that could happen in a hypothetical circumstance. So, so those things are important. They need to be hashed out at some point in time. But where this fight is, is really on that question of how are we going to divide the billions of dollars <laughs> that come in to MLB right now. And the players have gotten a smaller percent of that money in recent years. Prior to the lockout free agent class, the free agent classes had been remarkably slow. Um, you know, we can talk about the reasons that teams drop $1.6 or $1.7 billion on free agents in just a couple of weeks span this off season. But I think it's probably a combination of people wanting to know where they can go. and Frankly, it's not bad for the owners to walk into negotiations to be like, look, the CBA is fine. Like, we love this agreement. You just got money. We just got players. Like, why? look at all the money we just spent, right? Like, it gives them a little bit of a disingenuous argument. And you could don't look at those last four off seasons. Look at this one. Look at how great we were, right? <laughs> um, which, if I'm a player, I'm not, I'm not really having that. I think that what gets them moving is the calendar. So pitchers and catchers generally start to report to teams right around Valentine's Day. That date doesn't change, right? They are going to have to come up with something that people can agree to around that time for players to report to Florida and to Arizona. And if they don't, we're going to have a delay of the season. It's going to be just like the pandemic shortened season, hopefully in the sense that there's still baseball, but that delay will go on until there's an agreement. And right now the players want years off of free agency. They want guaranteed free agency at certain points in time. They want fewer, they want more arbitration years and fewer years on the minimum salary. And there are a lot of good reasons for that. And I don't know how much MLB is going to budge on any one of those things, let alone multiple of them. Yeah. I think like what you're saying, the calendar is the biggest motivating factor, but what MLB does have going for them, in my opinion, is that nobody really covered the lockout for multiple different reasons, but it helps them because the off season pretty much takes up the big key parts of football season. Cause you know, we have the bowl season that's just happened. And then we have the NFL playoffs. So we really have till Valentine's day in February when there's probably that dead period where the pro bowl weekend is to where people aren't going to be looking at everything football all week and all weekend. So that's probably the biggest time they're going to want to have something either close to done or done, in my opinion, because after that, it's going to be a little bit even worse of a PR nightmare because you have the NBA playoffs taking you till May, which hopefully the lockout doesn't go that long. But I'd say it's the calendar, like what Sarah was saying. Yeah, February 26th, we'll be here for you know what, and be out there. What is it in uh, Mesa, Arizona at Sloan Park? And I uh, hope the gates are open and people are filling the seats and watching the first day of spring training out there for the Cubs. Brandon and I have the good fortune of living here in the Tampa Bay area. And we've, we're surrounded by all of these teams for their spring training. It's, it's fantastic. And 
But I, I would I would miss that a great deal. That would to me if we're not there at February 26th. I mean, look, what, what are we talking about? Two months from now, folks. I mean, here we are, Christmas week, and just a couple more days to be Christmas. We're looking at, at at two months. And if these guys right now, if the doors closed, and I know they're probably not going to talk till at least after Christmas and maybe New Year's, they better be willing to sit down and talk about those main issues. I don't expect everybody to get what they want. You know, there's this thing called compromise. Unfortunately, a good compromise means when both people walk away from the table feeling a, a little bit of pain, you know, a little bit of gain, but a little bit of pain too. So both sides are going to have to come up with some kind of compromise, but Sarah, I'm with you. And I think probably Brandon is as well, that we find ourselves on the, the player side of what's, what's going on. I mean, our passions are there because to me, oh yes, great. You just spent $1.5 billion on, on a player you know, on a new stadium, or you spent equal amount on players. I don't know. I don't care. But what's happening, one, with the minor leagues, two, these guys that you just bring up, and as you well know, you probably heard me rant before about Chris Bryant, about the way the Cubs treated him. That's part of it. They, they, it's more than just these big issues. And when I see something like DH up there as, as something that the MLB is willing to talk about, that, you know, why, why is DH even a thing? That's money for everybody as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's interesting that you asked that question because it is money for everyone. But the reason it's a thing is because they they waited to keep it a thing for here. They wanted it to be an incentive that the players union would ha- would only be able to get if they were uh, to give up something else in some other part of negotiation. So that's the other thing that's happened. Like you'll notice you, they had some of these rules for the pandemic shortened season, having a DH in both leagues, having the expanded playoffs. Theoretically, they could have tried to negotiate that last year outside of the collective bargaining structure. They didn't do that. They didn't do it on purpose because they wanted to force people into concessions in this structure, right? And so when you save everything for the big talk (laughs) that comes up every five years, it's not that difficult to imagine that there are some hurt feelings and people, and and it's a lot to sort through. Um, Now, I want to get back to what you were saying about Chris Bryant and the minor leaguers for a second, because I think those are two very different things. And I think the way that the MLBPA will focus on that, and to be clear, minor leaguers are not covered under the MLBPA unless they're part of that 40-man structure for a team. And we can talk a little bit about how that works. But the that that difference, whether you're focusing on the Chris Bryants of the world or whether you're focusing on the guys who go back and forth, like the Randy Dobnicks of the world, I think changes fundamentally how you look at this negotiation. And I hope they're focusing on the latter, frankly, because the Chris Bryants of the world are fine. Hey, Brandon, did you have something else you want to ask about the CBA? Um, not on the CBA, but it's kind of on the lockout. And you were saying earlier how people don't want to hear millionaires and billionaires arguing about money. I'm wondering, because, you know, in this day and age, everybody has so many problems that we have to deal with that are real world problems. How do you think this lockout could impact them, not just on the field, but off the field as well? What do you mean by like for players in terms of, are you talking about their, you know, they don't have access to their trainers right now. They don't have access to their mental skills coaches right now. They don't, you know, there was this interesting video clip and and can I just say Rob Manfred just never disappoints. He is always not inspiring when you see him speaking. The day the lockout happened, there was an interview with him and in a press conference, he was asked if MLB would make an exception like the NHL did um, in their last negotiating cycle so that there would be a lockout, but players might have access to like, I don't know if they're working with a physical trainer who's helping them rehab a knee injury or something, they might have access to that physical trainer. And he said, no, he claimed that there were legal reasons. They just couldn't do it. And props to whoever asked this question. It was a great follow-up question in the press conference. And they said, actually, you know, the NHL made an exception. So clearly you could make one if you wanted to. And he blew it off. He said, we think that's a legal issue. (laughs) I think that's a issue of a league and and a group of players who are trying to play hardball with each other rather than see each other as human beings. And it tells you a lot about the posturing. And, you know, I mean, you can see the posturing on MLB's webpage right now. All of this, like graying out the players faces as if that's supposed to make everybody sad or something. I don't, I I pity the poor intern that had to do that. Like somebody had to 
could go replace all of these images. And, and that was not necessary. Follow-up research has shown that it was not legally necessary. It was just MLB being petty. I think as long as they're being petty about things like this, as long as they're keeping athletes from the coaches they work with to train and the coaches they work with to keep them healthy, I think that it shows a lot of animosity between the two sides that makes it harder to get a deal. That's that's pretty sad when you're being compared to the NHL and they're saying that the NHL did something right and you didn't because the NHL <laughs> does something plenty of times where they just mess up completely. Dude, I am in Chicago. The Blackhawks thing here yeah. has been. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm, <laughs> you do not want to be on the flip side of actually the NHL was better than you. Yeah, that, that's not a good thing. <laughs> I keep wondering if Jim Crane is writing his material, <laughs> the guy with the Astros, because <laughs> it's like, geez, <laughs> don't you sit down and talk to anybody before you actually roll this out. And as far as saying, yes, I'm sorry, no, the players aren't going to be able to have the advantage of whatever physical therapy they need, et cetera. First thing my mind went to is after watching the Braves, I'm saying, oh, well, I guess Charlie Morton's out of luck. Yeah, oh, how about all these guys with Tommy John's right now? Oh, I guess they're out of luck. Surely there's something. I don't care if they're doing some back backdoor deal or not. They need to take care of their players. One, because just like you're saying, Sarah, just being a human being. Or two, you know, they've, they've got to do something also because, well, <clears throat> protect your own investment if you want to look at it from just that perspective. Absolutely. I mean, these are... <laughs> They need these players to be the best they can possibly be for as long as possible for the good of their teams, right? Like there's there's no benefit in these players not playing to their potential. And look, I'm sure a lot of them are working with coaches from college, coaches from high school, like doing what they need to do to stay in shape. In fact, if you go on TikTok or Twitter, all of your favorite players are showing their off-season workout routines. It's pretty fun to see what it is they do to stay in shape. I mean, Nestor Cortez has this video where he's like doing hops with like a deadlift thing. And I'm like, I didn't know that was an exercise. That looks a little <laughs> bit dangerous, but um, maybe that's probably just because Nestor Cortez is in much better shape than I am. But you know, that it is in the team's interest to know what is going on there, right? Yeah. Like by, by cutting the players off there, they just hurt themselves. And it seemed a, a lot more like posturing and a lot less like actual working towards a towards a deal i don't know i hate to be pessimistic i want there to be baseball more than anything february 26th is actually my birthday oh and it would be amazing if for my birthday i got to watch some baseball uh, i just am, i'm i'm just not sure they're going to get things done in time well let's hope that's uh, hopefully we're wrong on that hopefully that there's going to be some kind of uh, divine intervention into the brain of man for the rest of them make things happen for <laughs> all of us good fans because uh one last thing I'll say about Manfred. I thought it was hilarious when he directed that letter to the fans, like, hey, I'm I'm out, I'm looking out for you guys. But yeah, anyway. Well, let, let's talk about how it's actually impacting. We were talking a moment ago about yes, February 26th, Sloan Park. That's when we want to see those cubbies. That's when we want to see things happening. Right now, we don't know, but there there isn't news in the last week or so because of uh, free agency. We're seeing some changes in minor league. That can, that can happen because it has nothing to do with the CBA. And we're seeing some th changes with coaches and managers. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening with the Cubbies? Yeah. I mean, so right before the lockout, they made a deal that I think surprised everyone. It definitely surprised me. I, I have to tell you a little bit of a story about this Marcus Stroman signing because I have been about as depressed about the outlook for my Cubs as you can be since July. I mean, I saw the writing on the wall. I knew when they went on that little losing streak after the combined no hitter, they did throw a combined no hitter against the Dodgers before everything went South. We're going to remind Dodgers friends, Dodgers <laughs> friends about that till the end of time. But you know, they, they trade, they went on a little bit of a losing streak. The writing was pretty much on the wall that they were going to trade all of their players. They traded Jack Peterson pretty early and then, the trade deadline, if you were a Cubs fan, was just a gut-wrenching day. I've never had a day of baseball like that, and I've been through a lot of disappointing Cubs seasons. I sort of thought the Cubs were on like a multi-year rebuilding process, and they still might be if, if some things don't pan out the way they could. But I really thought they were going to keep payroll as low as possible until some of the prospects they got both from the Darvish deals, which I also thought was a canary in the coal mine for a rebuild, and from 
trading their entire World Series core, Javi Baez, Anthony Rizzo, Chris Bryant, names that you wanted to be in blue pinstripes on the north side of Chicago forever, just gone. It sort of looked like their timeline was looking like 2023, 2024. And then there were some, you know, they made a move for Jan Gomes, who is not a traditional backup catcher, and he's not getting backup catcher money. I think that's a two-year, $13 million deal. So that's, you know, regular catcher money, Right. uh, which had Wilson Contreras out there tweeting airplanes. And Wilson Contreras is my favorite player. So anytime your favorite player is tweeting about being traded, it's a bad day. I was walking to get a cup of coffee thinking, okay, is there any possible way that that something good could come out of this? And honestly, God, I kid you not, the day the Cubs did sign Marcus Stroman, I'm walking across the street from Wrigley Field because that's where the Starbucks I go to happens to be. I get my coffee and I'm like, you know, if the Cubs did a deal for Marcus Stroman right now, I might actually believe that this team was trying to compete in 2022. And then the whole rest of the way home, I talked myself out of that deal. And honest to God, there were Twitter rumors within an hour of getting home (laughs) that Strowman was talking to the Cubs and the talks were heating up and he's tweeting Instagram stories from Michigan Avenue. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. So I have hope. A lot of Cubs fans have hope. Um, It has turned the north side of Chicago from a place where nobody thought there would be any deals and everybody was waiting to see the return for Wilson Contreras to we're definitely not trading Wilson Contreras. And can we have Carlos Correa, which is, you know, I don't know what to say. We are, we are an optimistic bunch. We went from, we, we are getting nothing to maybe we'll get Carlos Correa. <laughs> wow. Oh, Hey, you're, if you just joined us, so that you're listening to baseball biz and that's Sarah Sanchez from bleed cubby blue and cup of, Cup of blue, <laughs> cup of blue. Go on, give me, get it right there. Cup of cubby cup. blue. Jeez, there you geez. go, there you go. Oh, so Brandon from uh, at Sportsbit Spot, myself, Marker here with Baseball Biz. Man, we're talking about the Cubs at this point, and yeah, you mentioned Correa. I, I think a lot of us are wondering what's going to happen. Uh, what was about a month or so ago, Brandon? We were looking and saying, oh, who's having who's having breakfast with AJ Hinch? Oh, who's still having lunch with AJ Hinch? Oh, you know what? I th- I think that he's going to be going there. No. Ray didn't go there. So um, what was it? Oh, was it was it a former cub who went there? Who did uh, the Tigers pick up? Oh, um, oh Javi Javi Baez. Baez. Yeah, Javi, Javi Baez. Baez. Nah. Yeah, so there you go. I mean, another one of your Jed Hoyer you know, decisions. I, I, I'm like you. I think we talked about it a long time ago about who, who was all leaving. You had Baez leaving. Uh, you had Rizzo leaving. You had Kimbrell leaving. And who was the other gentleman escapes at the moment? That was, that was such a big change for that team. And I thought, what are these guys? Are they Pittsburgh? Are they, are they just unloading all the talent that they have and looking for some money or for something new? It has to be hard to be a, a Cubs fan. Looking to the future, I know you guys had a rough year last year. What do you think? You're uh, fourth in the what's National League Central? Uh, yeah, for 2021. That's Yeah, that's correct. So what are we looking at for 2022? What are we looking at as far as What's that roster look like now, and, and what do you think it's going to look like? Honestly, I mean, obviously everything has to go right, and we still have to have baseball for this to happen. But yeah, yeah. I, the NL Central is an interesting division. It's a lot like the NL East in that there's a ton of parity. So you have a lot of teams who are all hovering right around that 80 to 85 win mark, and it's a division that can be won with relatively few wins, right? Like you would never look at the NL West where the Dodgers are – hashing it out with the Padres and the Giants and think you're going to win a division with 85 wins. You can look at the NL Central and think that given what teams have done and and the Cubs have made a couple of savvy moves this season that I think put them solidly in a third or second place conversation. And if everything goes right, they could easily win the division just due to how close all of those teams are to each other. You know, the the Reds tried to, I don't know exactly what they were doing with Wade Miley. I was stunned that they DFA'd him over $10 million, but the Cubs picked up that contract. So they added Wade Miley to their roster in terms of starting pitchers. I said at the time, I liked him a lot better as a three or four than as a two. Uh, and by adding Marcus Stroman, that bumps Wade Miley back down into that three or four range. They're looking at a rotation that includes Marcus Stroman, Kyle Hendricks, Wade Miley, Adbert Alzali. And, you know, some combination of Alec Mills, Justin Steele, and Keegan Thompson. And that's not a bad rotation. It's not 
a top tier rotation by any stretch of the imagination. It is certainly a rotation that generates a lot more weak contact than a lot of strikeouts. So I think that's sort of where the Correa rumor started because that you have a rotation that generates ground balls like that. You need a shortstop <laughs> and your shortstop probably should not be Nico Horner, who I adore, but is much better at second base and not ready to be the shortstop for a he- ground ball heavy starting rotation. But but if they add that shortstop position, the team looks a lot better than you would think it has any right to look <laughs> when you think, oh, no, you got like 30 year old Patrick Wisdom and Frank Schwindel at the corners. They were not that much of a downgrade <laughs> from Chris Bryant and Anthony Rizzo last year. And and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Frank Schwindel and Patrick Wisdom are as good as Chris Bryant or Anthony Rizzo. Rizzo. They certainly are not. Um, but for a one year sort of like just comparing the the productivity you're getting out of the space and for half a season, that wasn't, they weren't awful. Um, you know, they're going to get Nick Madrigal back. That was one of the key pieces in the trade for Craig Kimbrell. So they have a little, they have a lot of depth at that second base position. And, and they've made some savvy moves in the outfield. They picked up Quint Frazier when he was removed from the Yankees roster um, for 40 man roster crunch before a rule five draft that didn't happen. Um, that may happen. And you would expect that to happen in the spring, but the Cubs were the beneficiaries there, right? Like they were able to add Clint Frazier, who's a high upside, <laughs> low draft pick who, you know, he could play in Wrigley Field. It, we'll see what happens. He's going to get a lot more playing time than he did in New York. Um, and if he's got those concussion issues under control and stuff, he could he could do some damage um, on the north side of Chicago. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what to think of this team, but I think they can win the NL Central. I don't think they can do much more than that, but I think the NL Central is there for the taking. And the, to me, like they're doing all these signings backwards. And I read your article <laughs> on yeah. Stroman coming in yesterday. And then how you, you were saying that it was, I believe, 23 or 24 when the prospects would be up here. Yeah. And I thought it was kind of backwards because usually you bring the prospects up and then you kind of bring in the veteran veterans to sort of flush it out and be that leadership. Are they thinking bring those guys in here now so they have like an established presence when those guys come up here in a couple of years? Well, for one thing, um, that's a great question, Brandon. I appreciate it. A um, couple of things. One, the, the Stroman deal is so short that there's a very good chance he wouldn't be here when that prospect class comes up. And the Cubs have some very interesting prospects. The number one prospect that I'm interested in is Brennan Davis, who is an outfielder with a outstanding bat by all uh, accounts. He's just he's going to do remarkable things on the north side of Chicago when he gets his chance. He'll probably arrive in late 2022, if there are no injuries and everything goes according to plan, possibly 2023 if there are injuries or something like that. Um, they have a catching prospect, Miguel Amaya, who is super interesting, although he hasn't quite developed the way they wanted him to, and he's getting Tommy John surgery, which is why you saw that short-term young bone steal. So these these veterans could still be a bridge <laughs> to that next class. The question that I have, it's not even really a question. What I think the Cubs did is they took a look at how angry their fans were at the prospect of another rebuild and how empty the stadium was at times in the second half. And you can't be a crown gem franchise in major league baseball and, and sustain that for a couple of years. The Cubs had a very real potential crisis in front of them. And I've not spoken to anybody in the front office about this. This is all like just in my head. This is what I think happened, but if they were burning through, a season ticket holder waiting list that had tens of thousands of names on it. And nobody wants those tickets right now because nobody wants to pay the priciest seats in the MLB to go watch 30 year old rookies who have been picked up on the waiver wire for three years. Like that's just not a deal that Cubs fans are willing to accept anymore if they ever were. And so it was pretty incumbent on this front office to bring in some players for Cubs fans to get excited about and to watch if they didn't want to lose a sub like a substantial number <laughs> of their hardcore. We will always show up fans in that park. And, and for generations, Cubs fans filled that park when those teams were not very good. And we aren't willing to do that anymore. Uh, it 
some of the emptiest seats, I, emptiest crowds I've ever seen at Wrigley Field happened after July last year. I went to multiple games for free. People would just call me and say, I can't get rid of these tickets. Will you just take one? <laughs> That's not supposed to happen on the north side of Chicago. Ooh, no, 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 no. no. I, I mean, I love it. Fans vote with their feet. You know, guess what? We're, you got to give us a reason to come back if you're going to treat us like that. Guess we're not going to be there. Kudos to them. And it sounds like, you know, the front office is listening. I'm glad to hear that part. It, it seems like they're listening at least a little bit. They knew they couldn't do nothing. So they they went out and got us a Marcus Stroman. And frankly, Stroman and Frazier have been great. They're fun on Twitter. They're talking smack. They're out there doing their things. I mean, Frazier's out there tweeting razors at the Yankees fans, which I think is hysterical. So <laughs> um, we'll, we'll see how that they'll fit in just fine, even if the Cubs only win 82 games and don't quite make the expanded playoff. Well, it, it's interesting, too, because you're seeing what the, the Cubs have actually they made some changes with the coaches as well, especially when it comes to hitting, didn't they bring in two new, uh, two new coaches with that? Yeah, they did. A um, couple of things about the Cubs hitting coach position for a second. Did y'all ever read the Harry Potter books and how like the defensive dark arts guy like changes every single year. Right. So they can never keep somebody in that job. Well, the Cubs have had, I think four now hitting coaches since 2016. They really should have never parted ways with John Maley. I think that was a mistake. Um, but as a result, it's just been a rotating cast of characters trying to figure out a way to make this offense more contact oriented, less home run heavy, less strikeout prone over and over and over. And so we'll see what the new regime can say there. I hope that they have gotten a little bit of an upgrade there. The three true outcomes approach in Chicago has been not the most fun to watch from a fan perspective. It is, you know, home runs are great, but not when they're interspersed with players who strike out 30 upwards of 30 percent of the time yeah yeah <laughs> we've had that for like 10 years now oh my lord make it stop <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's it's been kind of painful here but it's it, i have hopeful expectations about this I, I definitely see that looks like the cubs are moving in the direct direction this year and I, let me ask you a kind of a question that has nothing to do with performance cba or anything else Tell me a little bit about the the Cardinals rivalry and the White Sox rivalry. If I was a Chicago Cubs fan, which one am I more concerned about in, in making sure that we win that series? Oh, that's a great question, too. So I would say for the vast majority of Cubs fans, the answer is the Cardinals. Um, that's due to a couple of things. One, interleague play didn't count for anything for years. So the Cubs would play a couple of preseason games against the White Sox that were like exhibition games, but they weren't real games until – the late 90s, early 2000s with interleague play. But I will say this. I, I'm a Cubs fan who grew up outside of Chicago. I was born and raised in rural Utah. I grew up watching the Cubs on WGN. Uh, I'm one of those millions of Cubs fans from all over the country who that's who I could watch. So they're my favorite team. I could watch them when I came home from school and listen to Harry Carey call baseball games. And that was awesome. The White Sox, if you are a Cubs fan who grew up in Chicago and your best friends were like, White Sox fans or Cubs fans, and that was pretty much it. Uh, there, There is a lot more animosity there. And so if you come to a Crosstown Classic Series on either the north side or the south side, you will see a lot of mostly good-natured ribbing between Cubs fans and White Sox fans. A little bit of it will go over the top, and occasionally that will spill over into fights. It seems like there's always a fight or two during the Crosstown Classic between Cubs fans and White Sox fans. I don't remember the last time I saw an actual fist fight break out between Cubs fans and Cardinals fans. It just, <laughs> we're not that type of rivalry. We're like the, we're like the Midwest nice version of the Yankees Red Sox rivalry. Super classic, have a lot of games behind us, but probably not yelling, you, you know, Cardinals suck randomly or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> oh, and then, then you got fans like John Cusack who get, uh, who get peppered because it was, he went to support the, the White Sox as they advanced and, I forget some podcaster, somebody out there was giving the man polio and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Cusack just dressed him down because of his knowledge of the game and his knowledge of both teams and him being a fan of, of the game first. But anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> no, that's so funny. I mean, Cusack has a, he has kind of a all Chicago thing going on, which he has defended for years. I'm not going to say whether you can do that or not. I will say. <laughs> As a Cubs fan who didn't grow up in Chicago, and all of my friends already know this, I'm sure I'm going to get roasted on Twitter a bit for this, but I go and cheer for the White Sox frequently. Like I will go watch the White Sox play the Yankees and cheer for the White Sox. And 
I love Aloy Jimenez. I love Yohan Moncada. Tim Anderson is great. I think that's a really fun White Sox team. I head down there five to 10 times a year, just when there's a good giveaway. I think there's better beer and food at the White Sox park than there is at Wrigley. Now, Wrigley is a historic ballpark and I love it more than whatever they're calling the White Sox park these days. But <laughs> I think there is a space to, to like both the White Sox and the Cubs. I think Kusak occupies that space. I also understand why some people who are native Chicagoans believe this is anathema for some reason. Uh, you, you're just going to have to live with some of us who love all things Chicago. Brandon. Um, I've never really been to the White Sox stadium because I've heard, you know, people kind of make fun of it because it's boring. I mean, I, I want to go and travel around and see all these stadiums somehow, but is, is that like a nice stadium or is it kind of like true what people say how it's just a boring stadium? it's a nice stadium I don't think it's boring in the same way I, let me tell you where I think there are boring stadiums so I, I apologize in advance to my Nationals friends you should cover your ears right now um Nationals Park is boring it is the most you know we built a ballpark it doesn't have interesting sight lines or anything like that you can get good beer here and you can get like some good food and watch a baseball game and you'll probably never remember anything specific about like, oh yes. And as you walk around the outfield, you see X and that's so unique to only nationals park has this. It's just not a thing that I ever felt was like there, there's nothing at nationals park that stands out to me. I've been there four or five times now where I'm like, yes, this is a great park. Whereas you go to Camden yards, for example, and Camden yards has that really unique setup. You know, it's like right there in, in Baltimore, you've got the old industrial buildings like that you can see out in the field and you can see like all of the old Camden stuff and all the Orioles history. That's a unique park. That's a great place to see a game. I think the White Sox is closer to what they accomplished in Camden than what they did at Nationals Park. With one exception, they really should have kept the old frame of Comiskey and tried to like play off those sight lines and things. And, and I'm bummed that they didn't. I know why they didn't, but it's a nice enough place to watch a game. It doesn't have like quirky field things going on. Like, you know, Wrigley has the brick wall and the IV and all of that, but it has awesome views of the skyline. If you're looking out um, from the concourse, not from the park itself, but from the concourse, you can see an amazing view of the Chicago skyline from the South. I've gotten some great pictures of the Chicago skyline there. It does a great job of bringing in Chicago's local culinary and beer culture. And, and we are a beer town. <laughs> there are so many breweries in Chicago. It's a great place if you are a craft beer drinker. And if you go to a White Sox game, you can go down on, under the right field bleachers. And there's a, there's a place called the Craft Cave where they have brought in every beer you can possibly imagine from in and around the Chicagoland area. And you can sample it. And it's a lot of fun. You can see the game um, at field level. They have like a little cutout there. It's almost like you're in the bullpen, but they've, they've cut it out so you can watch the game from field level. That's a cool place to see a game. I, I am not going to lie. I've, I've sat there for batting practice before Koji Uiharo ran up to me and a friend of mine. We were sitting there once. It was, it was a blast. So I don't think the White Sox Park is boring in the same way some parks are. I understand why people might think that. I you know, it's a, it's a good experience for watching a baseball game. It's probably a more comfortable experience than Wrigley in some ways because you're not dealing with 1914 sight lines and seat view vantage points and stuff. But the Cubs have done a really nice job with their rehab of Wrigley Field. It's a, it's a great place to see a game. It's a beautiful place to see a game. It's my favorite field in America. And I, I just don't think they're comparable. I think that those old stadiums, <laughs> Wrigley and Fenway are kind of in a class by themselves. Yeah. Camden is the next tier because it's like the rehab. It's like the gut rehab of an original stadium. And then you have the Do Dodger Stadium and um, where the Angels play out in Anaheim. And those two are kind of like the old 60s stadiums. And everything else is kind of new, which is wild to me that we have had that much turnover with MLB stadiums. We'll have to ask you about the trop on another show. <laughs> you know what? I've not, I've never been to the trop. I need to get to the uh, trop, but it will probably not surprise you that it, it's not high on my list of parks geez, to travel just, to. <laughs> I'm, I'm hurt, sir. I'm hurt. It's <laughs> not high on my list either. <laughs> Your ground rules include a roof, and I like when ground rules include include a roof. That's always tough for me. Oh yeah, well, we'll we'll, we'll talk about it a little later on. But right now, I want to remind <laughs> everybody again: we're talking with Sarah Sanchez from Cup of Cubby Blue. And also Bleed Cubby Blue. 
tell us again what what you're doing with those verticals, those particular portals again. What what are you writing? And is it, is it um, just finding articles? Am I finding podcasts? What am I going to find? Uh, most of my writing is at Bleed Cubby Blue. I occasionally publish a, a random story here or there at some other places, but it's mostly Cub stuff. I do a lot of statistical analysis. I tend to be the person that looks um, at you know, through pitching data and through ground ball rates, those types of things for all of our Cubs' favorite players. I leave the minor league staff to our very talented minor league staff over there at Bleed Cubby Blue. So I do a lot less prospect analysis, but we have a great crew over there doing prospect analysis as well. And then Cub and Cubby Blue is really your weekly check-in for the biggest stories with the Cubs. And I try to cover everything that is going on, whether that is lockout news, whether that is looking at roster moves, who's going to play second base, will there be a season, front office moves, all everything, anything you can imagine there. At the moment, I am currently working on our annual 12 Days of Cubsmas series, which means it's just basically a retrospective uh, t- key to the old Christmas carol. So, you know, we kind of look at one Marcus Stroman signing two improbable rookie of the year candidates and Frank Schwindel and Patrick Wisdom, that type of thing. I love it. I love it. I had to go around the caroling with that. That'd be neat. Well, oh. you know, it's, it's funny that you bring up the caroling thing because my friend Danny, who occasionally co-hosts Cup of Cubby Blue with me, uh, just recently did Cubs caroling in the neighborhood. It not only got picked up by Fox News because they sang, Correa, please come to Chicago. And Carlos Correa saw it and retweeted it. So, you know, Correa to the Cubs, man. I don't know what else to say. We got we got the player retweet. I love it. All in the season. Brandon, you got any other uh, final questions for Sarah? No, I, I think we got all, all my questions answered. <laughs> well, now we just need to send all those answers to Rob Manford and tell him to act on them and we'll be okay. <laughs> Sarah, I can't thank you. No, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was going to say from your mouth to Rob Manfred's ears, please just get a baseball guy. Yeah, well, we know, we know that's, that's what we're all looking for. And like you were saying, February 26th as a Cubs fan, I want to be out there in Mesa, Arizona. I want to be in Sloan, Sloan Park. I want to be, I want to see that team. You know, I want to see Stroman. Come on, come on, Rob. Come on players. Find some common ground. You know, and don't hold up things like, you know, well, yeah, we can do the DH like you're giving me something. OK, that's it's a given. OK, boys and girls, let's 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 talk some real meat and potatoes, find some common compromise. And we're doing it for the fans. OK, die trap over. <laughs> oh, once again, Sarah, thank you again for joining us here on Baseball Biz. And, and Brandon, I really love having you here. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I always love talking baseball. Yeah. Well, thanks again, everybody, for listening today on Baseball Biz. We look forward to talking to you again real soon after this Christmas season. Also, special thanks to X Take RUX for the music rocking forward.